good evening, everybody. I apologize that uh, we are starting late. I'm sure you're all tired, and uh, it's not a very, uh, you know, the time where one listens to complicated stuff. But uh, we must do what we must do. So what I'm going to do, uh, uh, I will uh, first of all uh, to uh, put it in context. Uh, the previous session um, has already uh, told us something about the kind of problems uh, there are with regard to representation of Hinduism, and perhaps if you were to enlarge it, of representation of Indian civilization uh, in textbooks for a variety of reasons, and we don't have time to uh, get into that. Uh, now, as far as the title of my talk is concerned, I'm sure some of you are perhaps uh, wondering uh, at, the, at the title, which, uh, which uh, some might think that maybe uh, have I lost it? What do I mean when I say Indian foundations of modern science? So what I'm going to do is, uh, I actually wrote it up, and you can uh, read it word for word on Medium. So if you just Google it, you'll see the entire text. And the reason why I wrote it up, I normally don't do it, is because there are uh, substantial things in this talk which I'm quite sure you have never heard about, which would uh, appear very, very surprising to you. But uh, this is stuff which has all been peer reviewed, and it's known in the scholarly community. The only problem is that for whatever reason, uh, these things have not filtered down to uh, the general public. So, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it because I want to be absolutely uh, precise with regard to the words that are being used here. And as you'll see, some of these are very um, surprising claims. All right. Uh, Scholars see India and Greece as the two principal birthplaces of science, but in many ways the Indian contributions are the most dramatic for they include the symbol for zero and the numerals, the sutras of Panani describing Sanskrit uh, grammar, binary numbers of Pingala, which is again about 200 BC, algebra, earliest astronomy, and the physics of Kannada with its laws of motion. Of these, Kanada is the least known. He may not have presented his ideas as mathematical equations, and this is 500 BC, but he attempted something that no physicist to date has dared to do. He advanced a system that includes space, time, matter, as well as observers. And he also said that whatever can be described as a scientific system has got to do with motions of objects, of atoms, and so on. Uh, he also postulated four types of atoms, two with mass, like proton and electron, and two without, like neutrino and photon. A thousand and more years after Kanada, Aryabhata postulated that Earth rotated and advanced the basic idea of relativity of motion. And of course, uh, historians of astronomy know it very well. And then there is imaginative literature, like the epics and the Puranas, that speak of time travel, airplanes, cloning of embryos, communication over vast distances, and weapons that can destroy everything. There are also anomalous statements in Indian text whose origin is not understood. Just to mention a few, uh, the correct speed of light, the uh, correct distance to the sun, cosmological cycles that broadly correspond to the numbers accepted currently, the correct number of species on Earth, and so on. And we'll come to these. Uh, uh, anomalies later. And uh, uh, with regard to this imaginative literature, this has had uh, uh, a lot of political uh, implications because there are some who take these statements to be representative of the science of ancient times and uh, therefore then they are ridiculed by their opponents as being totally out of touch um, with, 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 with the facts. So it's become a kind of a political issue as well. Uh, now, to go to mainstream science, the discovery of infinite series and calculus by Newton and Leibniz heralded the scientific revolution, which was to change the world. But new research has shown 
that over two centuries prior, the Kerala School of Mathematics had already developed calculus, and some historians suggest that this and advanced astronomical knowledge uh, from Kerala went to Europe via the agency of the Jesuits and traders that provided the spark for its further development. But of course, there are other historians of science who dispute that. But the facts that all this did occur in India about 250 years prior to Newton is uh, acknowledged by everybody. Uh, one might add that ancient Indian Ayurveda texts included the ideas of germs uh, and inoculation, which was uh, also discussed in an uh, earlier uh, session, that have revolutionized medicine. Uh, there are also ways the Indian ideas inspired European scientists. Mendeleev was inspired by the two-dimensional structure of the Sanskrit alphabet to propose a similar two-dimensional structure of chemical elements. Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Austrian, a founder of quantum theory, credited ideas in the Upanishads that led him to the key notion of superposition that was to bring about a revolution in physics and later in chemistry, biology, and technology. In fact, one could say that uh, most of the amazing uh, developments uh, that have taken place in science and technology in the past 100 years are due to our understanding of quantum mechanics and the development of quantum mechanics, which at least according to its founder, uh, one, of, one of its uh, founders was uh, an idea which, uh, f as far as he was concerned, came to him from uh, the famous Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma, that something, a thing can, can have everything. So that was the idea of superposition, which, is, uh, which goes against Aristotelian logic. Okay, uh, this was just a random list of advances from the hard sciences that show that Indian ideas and contributions have shaped science in many different ways. Now, I hope to show now that they remain equally central to its future unfoldment, but before I do so, I also wish to touch upon Indian influence on linguistics and logic. Uh, Panani's work showed the way to the development of modern linguistics through the efforts of scholars such as Franz Bob, de Saussure, Bloomfield, and others. Uh, Saussure, in his most influential work, Course in General Linguistics, that was published posthumously in 16, 1916, took the idea of the use of formal rules of Sanskrit grammar and applied them to general linguistic phenomena and thereafter they were used for various other social systems because social interactions also constitute a language. The structure of Panini's grammar contains a meta language, meta rules and other technical devices that make this system effectively equivalent to the most powerful computing machine. Although it didn't directly contribute to the development of computer languages, it influenced linguistics and mathematical logic, which in turn gave birth to computer science. Uh, the works of Panani and uh, Bharata Muni, the author of the Nati Shastra, also presaged the modern field of semiotics, which is the study of signs and symbols uh, as a significant component of communications. Uh, Bharat, uh, Bharata's Nati Shastra has much material on acting, signs, gestures, and posture each one of which communicates its own specific meaning to the spectator. The search for universal laws of grammar underlying the diversity of languages is ultimately an exploration of the very nature of the human mind. The other side of this grammar is the idea of a formal system, cannot describe reality completely since it leaves out the self. As human society evolves, signs and symbols in use lose their original meaning and manners change and fashions come and go and therefore formal systems have their own limitations which is of course recognized now the Godel's incompleteness theorem which told us that logic has its uh, limitations. Now let's come to modern logic which is at the basis of um, uh, the development of uh, machines and uh, computer circuits and all that that Indian uh, thought was central to the development of machine theory is asserted by Mary Boole, the wife of George Boole, inventor of modern logic, who herself was a leading science writer in the 19th century, although this fact is not very well known. She claimed that George Everest, who lived for a long time in India and whose name was eventually applied to the world's highest peak, was the intermediary to the Indian ideas and they influenced not only her husband, that is George Boole, but the other two leading scientists in the attempt to mechanize thought, 
Augustus de Morgan and Charles Babbage. In fact, Charles Babbage is sometimes called the father of uh, the computer. She says in her essay on Indian thought and Western science in the 19th century, which she wrote in 1901, think what must have been the effect of the intense Hinduizing of three such men as Babbage, de Morgan, and George Boole on the mathematical atmosphere of 1830 to 1865. She further speculates that these ideas, from India that is, influenced the development of vector analysis and modern mathematics. Much prior to this, Mohsin Fani, who was a Persian um, historian, 17th century, he wrote a book called Dabistani e Madhahib, or Mazahib, he claimed that, and this is uh, the general understanding of this history in the Middle East, he claimed that Callisthenes, who was in Alexander's party, took logic texts from India, and the beginning of the Greek tradition of logic must be seen in this material. In Indian logic, minds are not empty slates. The very constitution of the mind provides some knowledge of the nature of the world. The four pramanas through which correct knowledge is acquired our direct perception, uh, inference, analogy, and verbal testimony. Now, physics with observers. The Indian uh, tradition of physics includes the laws of motion in the Vaisheshika Sutras, and I already mentioned Kanada, uh, and of course, uh, the idea of relativity of motion, uh, not of course motion at high speeds, uh, of Aryabhata 500 CE. Perhaps they did not directly influence discovery of physical laws in Europe, but Indian ideas that place the observer at center prefigure the conceptual foundations of modern physics, and this is acknowledged by the greatest physicists of the 20th century. Now, in one sense, the journey of science is the discovery of consciousness. This is paradoxical, for we experience reality in consciousness, and yet are content uh, to be oblivious of its nature. In the West, the universe was seen as a machine, going back to Aristotle and the Greeks, who saw the physical world constituting or consisting of four kinds of elements of earth, water, fire, and air. This model continued in Newton's clockwork model of the solar system. Indian thought, in contrast, had a fifth element, Akasha. Uh, now, of course, you had ether also in the West, but that was the minority tradition which Plato talked about. The general the standard view of Aristotle was only four elements. So in Indian thought, the fifth element, Akasha, which is the medium of inner light and consciousness. Uh, the problem of observers is one of the major unsolved areas of physics. And my own sense is that Indian ideas will play an important role in the uh, further progress in this field. Uh, and that's what I want to uh, build upon, because uh, one can also say that, OK, what has happened has happened. It's all just a history. And that is true. We, we are all together. Um, on this earth at this point in time. And the world faces uh, certain um, um, challenges. And, uh, and science has uh, reached up to a certain point. Uh, but uh, what we want to find out is, are these um, Indian and Vedic ideas uh, likely to have any role to play in how science might evolve uh, in the coming decades and in the coming century. But before that, very briefly, uh, cosmology both at the personal and the cosmic levels. The Rig Veda speaks of the universe being infinite in size. Um, a famous mantra speaks of how taking infinity out of infinity leaves it unchanged. Uh, this indicates that paradoxical property of the notion of infinity were known. The evolution of the universe is according to cosmic law. Since it cannot arise out of nothing, the universe must be infinitely old. Since it must evolve, there are cycles of chaos and order or creation and destruction. Uh, beyond the solar system, other similar systems were postulated, um, you know, uh, very many of them, which are now being uh, uh, observed, the exoplanets, and many of them have been uh, observed in the last 25 years. Uh, the Sankhya system describes evolution at cosmic and individual levels. Uh, it views a reality as being constituted of purusha or consciousness that is all pervasive, motionless, unchangeable, and prakriti, which is the phenomenal world. Now, evolution begins by purusha and prakriti creating um, uh, mahat, which is uh, nature in its dynamic uh, aspect, and from there various other uh, 
um, properties emerge, including intelligence and so on, and various uh, um, uh, senses. Um, now, the evolution in Sankhya is an ecological process determined completely by nature. It differs from modern evolution theory in that it presupposes a universal consciousness. In reality, modern evolution also assigns intelligence to nature uh, in its drive to select certain forms over others, as well as in the evolution of intelligence itself, so that perhaps uh, the difference between these two is not as great as one imagines. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, the Yoga Sutra, uh, a great exposition on the nature of the mind. And uh, um, knowledge uh, in the Vedic system is classified in two ways, the higher or unified and the lower or dual. In higher, knowledge concerns the perceiving subject, which is consciousness, whereas the lower knowledge concerns objects. Uh, the higher knowledge can be arrived at through intuition. And uh, the lower knowledge is analytical and it represents standard sciences with its many branches. There is a complementarity between the higher and the lower. Okay, now where is science going? Uh, let me uh, place this whole uh, discussion in uh, context. Uh, last year, uh, uh, at the highest level, uh, the scientific uh, leadership in the US decided to fund a series of workshops, week-long workshops, uh, at many different places uh, in the US and also in Cambridge University uh, in England. And uh, the whole idea was to ask the question whether machines will ever become conscious. And this was a group of about 30 odd people, and some of them were physicists, computer scientists, neuroscientists, and philosophers. So we met at different places, and uh, the discussion of whether machines will be, ever become conscious uh, brings up many other questions such as, well, first of all, uh, the very question of what is consciousness, you can't define consciousness mathematically, but we all know what it is. Uh, perhaps uh, speaking uh, more loosely, we could say the capacity for self-reflection or self-awareness. And uh, if you uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, this is computable because uh, self-awareness or uh, self-consciousness arises out of the activity, the electrical activity that takes place in the brain. And if you start with the premise that all of this can be emulated, because we are not talking about what uh, computers of tomorrow can do, we are interested in the general question of what computers of, let's say, 100 years from now will be able to do. So if all of this is uh, emulatable, if you can emulate through, uh, through uh, computer programs, uh, whatever goes on in the brain, then you are driven to the conclusion that if uh, consciousness as a phenomenon arises in the brain, uh, then consciousness should also arise in such a machine, right? And therefore, uh, the, it brings up many uh, other questions as to, well, uh, what is the relationship between, uh, uh, between consciousness and physics? Uh, is uh, consciousness an emergent phenomenon? Just as if you look at physics as the most fundamental theory of reality, uh, chemistry arises out of physics, biology arises out of chemistry, then are you to say that uh, consciousness arises out of biology? And if that is the case, then all explanations of consciousness should be already contained in our theories of physics. We may not have those theories of physics right now, but at some future time, we should be able to do so. So this is the general premise. And uh, the, uh, we, as a group of 30 odd people, some of the world's leading scientists, uh, we polled ourselves. And uh, I can tell you what the conclusions was. About 60% of the guys uh, and women in our group uh, were perfectly content with the idea that machines will eventually become conscious. And there was a minority of us 
And I was one of uh, those in the minority who said that machines will not be conscious. Although, you know, once you start asking questions, you can also say, well, the brain is also a machine, although it's not a silicon machine, it's a biological machine. So why can biological machines become conscious? Because it's much easier to concede that point. And why can't silicon machines become conscious? And this, uh, this can be... Uh, you know, debated from many perspectives. And there are some of these, you know, very well-known, very good scientists who are quite convinced that no, there is no reason why intelligence and consciousness should not be computable. And of course, more and more of what humans do uh, is being uh, mimicked, if you will, by machines. Now, we were all, all of us who were in this group, were quite agreed that literally all the jobs that human beings do, cognitive function, would be emulated by machines. So we were all agreed that as far as uh, implications of all of this for politics, for society, uh, would be, you know, most, uh, most revolutionary, or if one were to look at the possibilities of dystopia of one reason or the other, in spite of UBI, universal basic income that a lot of people are talking about, clearly uh, this would create challenges that uh, nobody knows how to deal with. But that's not what our uh, task in these uh, meetings was. Uh, there were two philosophical ideas that the uh, participants uh, in this uh, uh, set of meetings uh, articulated, and they, both of these philosophical ideas turn out to be Indian ideas. The individuals who were in support of the idea that uh, computers will become conscious uh, talked about uh, the Buddhist idea of shunyata. So many of the people, and they were Americans and Europeans, I was the only Indian, uh, many of these people were seriously attracted to uh, Buddhism and uh, the idea that really there is nothing more uh, to the body excepting the emergence through this emptiness of mind which can of course uh, have, uh, uh, have uh, traces or influence which can go beyond in very complicated ways and you can bring in a lot of the other apparatus as we know that we have in Mahayana for example. So a lot of those people did actually use this philosophical basis and the other group uh, spoke of Vedanta. That was the other group. Now, as you know, and all of you may not know, uh, the early pioneers of quantum mechanics uh, were in favor of the Vedantic idea. Uh, Schrodinger, for example, he speaks of it uh, in his book, What is Life, or uh, in, in other texts, uh, in his autobiography, and so on and so do others. And the general idea that they refer to, and this is part of what is called the orthodox Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, the idea there is that physical reality and consciousness are two different things. And a physical system, when you measure it, it's in a state of superposition. That's what the basic idea of quantum mechanics is. There are two ideas. One is superposition. Many things which are mutually contradictory can coexist in a quantum state, which is, the way, which is the theory at the most fundamental level of reality. But when consciousness interacts with it, the state collapses to one of the many different possibilities. So in other words, we create reality through observation. Now these are ideas which are part of Vedanta in many of its forms. In fact, uh, some of you or m many of you may be, uh, may be aware of one of the Vedantic ideas which is called uh, Drishti Srishti, that you create out of observation. Drishti means observation and Srishti means creation. In fact, uh, the, formal, um, the formal statement of Drishti Srishti as one of the schools is only three or four hundred years ago because there was a question within Indian Vedantic circles, well, how does Ishvara create something? Because after all, you have laws, Rit. Rit is fundamental to the Vedas, the Vedic systems. Everything is according to law. If everything is according to law, then how can 
Shiva or Vishnu or whosoever your deity is or consciousness create anything. So the idea was proposed that uh, through observation uh, creation is made. Now this is not a recent idea. This is not 300 years old because go back 600 CE, uh, 1400 years ago, you have the idea of Sri Chakra or Sri Yantra which is a very popular uh, system within uh, intellectual Vedanta, uh, particularly in the south and elsewhere as well. So if you know all of the cosmos in the Sri Yantra or Sri Chakra is described in terms of these 43 triangles which uh, create a whole layered aspect to reality which is supposed to be a layered representation of the inner cosmos but also of the outer cosmos. Now it's all according to laws because you have Prakriti or the goddess and you can see the goddess at the very end when you go to the very end, uh, to the very heart of the Sri Yantra. But, so it's only about Prakriti. Right in the center, which is invisible, is Shiva or Purusha, right? So the whole idea in Tantra was that Shiva cannot be found. The more you look for it, the more it disappears. It's infinitesimal. So Shiva or Purusha governs the world through observation. It's at the point of observation, which is something that you cannot put your finger on that creation is made. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, no, I'm, not, uh, I'm not certain that the creators of quantum mechanics were aware of all these very subtle ideas of Vedanta, but through also from, through their own independent thought, they also spoke of what uh, the uh, mentor to uh, Richard Feynman, namely John Wheeler, who's a professor at uh, uh, Princeton University, he called the participatory universe. The universe, through the act of observation of the various agents who are in it, uh, creates its own direction. So this is, this is a fundamentally a Vedantic idea. So there are all of these ideas that uh, uh, are, uh, uh, that are uh, at a point of convergence and which then have within them um, the possibility of giving us some clues as to where science might go. And where science might go might also tell us where technology might go and that in turn would have clues as to where uh, society would go. Now, uh, the two terms that uh, came up during uh, these series of meetings was little c and big c. Little c, c for consciousness. And little c was the view of those scientists who claim that consciousness is emergent. Consciousness is small and it's emergent. Of course, it has wonderful properties. It gives us the ability to understand reality, even though that is so surprising and astonishing that here, some activity inside our brains is, makes it possible for us to comprehend the entire cosmos, right? That itself is magical, but it does have that property and people are quite prepared to concede that. On the other hand, and this is like the Buddhist idea that I already mentioned. On the other hand, you have the big C idea, which is that, uh, that consciousness is universal. It's much bigger than the consciousness of us different individual agents. Now, somebody might say, well, it's easy to say that, you know, we, we, we are approaching, from, approaching it from a scientific perspective. So a scientist would say, or a skeptic would say, why should I accept big C? What is the proof? What's the proof that big C exists? Uh, outside of the domain of philosophy. In the domain of philosophy, all the transcendentalist ideas and transcendentalism is not only the mainstream idea in, uh, in uh, Vedanta or Indian thought or Vedas, but it's also been a part of certain Western uh, traditions as we know, Plato or Kant, Immanuel Kant was also a transcendentalist. Now, uh, so what's the proof? Do we have any proof? Well. Uh, we spoke, and this brings us back to uh, the, uh, in the beginning of my talk, I talked about how there is a lot of anomalous stuff in the Indian tradition. And there is probably anomalous stuff or anomalous manner in which all creativity occurs. Uh, for example, the beginning of uh, 
the industrial uh, revolution, the invention of the sewing machine by, was it Geoffrey Howe in America in 1776? Before that time, uh, women um, in most places used to spend most of the time darning clothes or sewing, right? But uh, there were a lot of very smart people at that time who were trying to look for a machine which would be able to sew. And they had uh, hit a wall. And then this guy sees a dream. In the dream, he sees um, an Indian throw a spear with an eye in its front. And he woke up and he knew that that's the kind of a needle he needed with a hook which would be able to lift, uh, uh, lift uh, thread in that machine. And likewise, uh, Kekule in 1850, when one of the big chemistry problems was the structure of benzene ring, uh, was, uh, saw a dream. And in the dream, he saw six snakes, each holding the tail of the next one in its mouth. And he woke up and he realized that that was to be, or that was, that was the solution to the problem of the benzene ring. These are six carbon atoms in a circle, right? There are many, many others. Uh, most of the discoveries, uh, if you talk to, to some of the greatest uh, scientists uh, who live now or who have been polled in the past, and Jacques Hadamard, the French mathematician, actually polled uh, more than a hundred uh, mathematicians and scientists in the 19th century, and they all said discovery or creativity is not at the end of an analytical process. It seems to occur spontaneously. Or Roger Penrose, uh, the prominent physicist, uh, he claimed that he discovered the solution to the irregular tile problem when he was, he had been thinking about the problem without a solution and he was crossing the street in Oxford. He had a visitor from the US and as he crossed the street, he felt this idea that he had the solution. He didn't quite know what the solution was. He rushed to his office and there it was. Uh, he found uh, the solution to this very, very major mathematical problem. In my own case, as a little anecdote, uh, the year was uh, uh, 92, November. I was reading uh, The New Yorker, and on the very last page, there used to be a one-page essay, and this one was by John Updike. And this essay, uh, John Updike, the American novelist, the essay started out by saying that, isn't it amazing that we don't pay attention to the fact that the sun and the moon are about the same size uh, looking from the earth, which is of course why there are eclipses. And the moment I read it, it had nothing to do with anything that I had been doing for uh, many years. And I had been uh, exploring uh, the astronomy of the earliest Indian period, and I'd hit a wall. Uh, and this had nothing to do with astronomy. It was a general observation. But I knew I had the solution to the problem that I was looking for. I rushed to, the, rushed to my library, and I opened up the index of my Rig Veda book, and I looked at, just counted the numbers, 1,017 hymns, which is 339 times 3, and I immediately realized that, and then there was a lot of corroborating information that I can't go into right now, that the Vedic rishis had determined that the sun and the moon are both 108 times their respective diameters from the earth. And therefore, on a, on a equinox, when the day is equal to the night, if the radius is 108, half, di half uh, of the circumference will be pi into 8, pi into 108, which is 339. And the whole uh, Vedic idea is that the universe is tripartite. You know, you have the earth, you have the atmosphere, you have the, you have the skies, and so on. So 339 times 3 is 1,017, the total number of hymns. The temple architecture, the Garbha Griha, uh, the Sanctum Sanctorum, is 54 units away from the door, from the Gopuram. And the circumference of the whole temple, the Vedic temple, is supposed to be 180 units, which is 360 by 2. So there's a whole astronomy that emerged uh, out of all of this. And, uh, and so this was an example of spontaneous uh, awareness where you come by something that you're not even looking for. Perhaps the most dramatic example of all of this is one of the greatest mathematicians of the past 100 years, which is Srinivasa Ramanujan. As you know, he died at the age of 
33, if I'm not mistaken, and he was a self-taught mathematician. And uh, uh, he died, I think, in 1917 uh, or thereabouts. And he would wake up and come up with formulas which he could not explain. And when uh, people like G.H. Hardy, who was one of the leading uh, mathematicians of his time, who had called him, this was a self-taught mathematician. He goes to Cambridge, and then he writes uh, papers. And then he falls very sick. But uh, before he falls sick and comes back to India, Hardy asked him many times, how do you discover this? Because what is the normal way you make any discoveries? You have the purvapaksha, you have the previous knowledge, you work upon it, and then you try various combinations, permutations, and then you come up with some other formula, right? Or you have a framework, you come up with some axioms, then you try to use logic to see what kind of theorems you can prove. But here is a guy who just writes the final product, and he can't even explain where it came from. And so he asked him, and Ramanujan said, well, the goddess Namagiri, who was his family's goddess, comes to him in his sleep, which means he has a vision, and he sees this formula. He can't even explain it, and he writes it down. And then uh, he died very young. His uh, textbooks, he was sick. He went back to India for a couple of years, and he would scribble on, uh, on these notebooks. These notebooks were lost for 50 years. They were rediscovered in the 1970s. And since the 1970s, mathematicians, the, some of the best mathematicians in the world have been studying these notebooks, and they're coming to a whole wealth of information which cannot be explained away. If information is not to be explained away, it's not computable. You know, that's one way of looking at it. Or another way, you might say, well, to say that uh, the goddess gave it something to you or it came spontaneously are maybe poetic ways of saying that somehow it came to you in a flash, right? But clearly what it means is that it's not computable. If it's not computable, a computer will not be able to go from what the prior knowledge was to this next level. So uh, the, the grounds on which the minority of us argued that machines would not become conscious is that machines of today may be uh, classical, right? The circuits do things in a particular order, which is known in advance what the logic is, how the machines work. But uh, physical nature and us, our brains themselves, cannot be classical machines. Ultimately, all nature at its deepest level is quantum mechanical. And if we are quantum mechanical machines, and we are approaching it not from the perspective of Vedanta or Indian knowledge, but let's say from modern knowledge. If you are quantum mechanical machines, then possibly there is something to the way quantum mechanical machine works, which is parallel by this property of consciousness. Now, when you go back to Kanada, what Kanada did, and this is 500 BC, he said, well, you have objects, and these objects have various properties, and they have motions. Because he did say that all the properties that you can obtain about, uh, about systems is through their motions, as we do in physics also. We look at uh, motions associated with different objects, or combination of objects. You have um, chemicals and so on, or atoms and so on. But he also said, so this is a triad, and then there is another triad. The other triad is the universal, the particular. The word vasheshika is the word for particular. There are certain particular properties that we see. And the third element of that triad is what he calls samavaya. He says it's a, there is a manner in which consciousness and physical reality interact at the point which is called samavaya, which is quite like what uh, quantum mechanics, through its uh, logic, which is uh, a logic which has its own prehistory, arrives at. And so this is another example where by intuition alone, uh, something quite amazing was done. So to come back to all those anomalous things, because where, when it's stated that here in the Indian tradition, certain such things were, were said and they have come to pass, there are two ways of looking at it. One is that, well, it's like science fiction of our times, right? Science fiction writers also imagine lots of amazing stuff. The other 
thing is that in science fiction, of course, what you're trying to do, you have certain scientific theories right now, you push at the limits and say, hey, if you take this idea to its further, to the, to, to its furthest corner, what can happen or what will happen to the solar system and this and that. While here, through um, the discovery of the inner space, because when you go to yoga, for example, and you are able to completely calm uh, the nirodha of the vrittis in the sea of your mind, then you come to a state where you seem to have access to all kinds of amazing knowledge. So this is the idea. So this doesn't mean, because sometimes people say, well, if the speed of light was known, you know, one of the geniuses who lived uh, about 500 years ago, 1370s, he was the prime minister in the court of the Vijayanagar Empire, and his name was Sayanacharya. He wrote also, apart from his administration, he also wrote commentary on many of the Vedic texts, including the Rig Veda. So in his commentary on the hymn to the sun, the Surya hymn, he says, you who, has, who travels at the speed of 2,202 yojanas in half a nimesha. And he wrote it, people forgot about it, and then the standard uh, uh, editions of the Rig Veda was done by Max Muller in the late uh, um, 1800s. And then just 20 or 30 years ago, somebody said, well, nobody has paid attention to this fact of 2,202 yojanas in half in Nimesha, because Nimesha is a standard measure. It's about one-fifth of a second. You divide up the time in different units, and it's all very well known. And yojana is also a standard uh, uh, measure. And Somebody did a quick exercise and he found that it's exactly 186,000 miles per second. So this is an example because this, this doesn't mean, and I'm not uh, in agreement with those who say, well, there must have been telescopes, maybe just like people after Galileo looked at the motion of the uh, planets around, or the satellites to Jupiter and so on, which is how the speed of light was first uh, determined in Europe, I think in the late 1600s. Prior to that, even Newton thought that light had infinite speed. So here, uh, through intuition, he came by this number, and I don't think, I, I don't agree uh, with those who say that you actually had a physics where such a measurement was made. But I believe that this is the way consciousness works. If you are truly in touch, with yourself, with the self within you, uh, then uh, you have access to uh, what might be called extraordinary knowledge. And you have so many different examples of it. And that's the only way you can see it. And in fact, all discovery, uh, it's not just the yogis, all discoveries uh, are like this. They occur in moments where you feel dissociated. I know some Nobel Prize winners myself, and they say, well, I don't know what is wrong with me, and I was in this strange, strange state, and then suddenly I got this idea. And then, of course, some, some of those guys just have one great idea. They're not necessarily very wise people, because they don't have an idea of the larger picture. Because here, because here what we are talking about is the relationship between the outer cosmos and the inner cosmos. And the whole idea is by exploring the inner cosmos, uh, you can also obtain something of outer cosmos. And this is absolutely extraordinary because this is not a part of the mainstream uh, uh, paradigm. And this is the reason, uh, the question sometimes has been asked, why this much of opposition to, um, to the Indian, to the Indian civilizational idea, because it's totally in opposition to progressivism. Progressivism is that across history, through various increments, mankind has reached a certain point, and now it's poised to reach other levels. While what this says, and what Indian, India, the whole Indian civilizational idea, or the whole idea of Consciousness as being the most fundamental stuff says is that no, it's all there. It's, it's, it's also something which was captured by in one of the dialogues in the Republic uh, where um, uh, Plato is uh, talking to his uh, 
Socrates, is, Plato of course is the writer, he's talking to uh, uh, his disciples and the whole question is what is education all about? Is education a vessel to be filled which is the mainstream uh, modern idea that information minds are empty vessels and you pour information into it and you can pour more and more and that's how you see more and more. While the idea which was quite widespread and which is probably also the Greek idea and maybe even the Latin idea which is the idea in the classical world is that mind is a flame to be lit. So once that flame is lit you can then go into all dark spaces and dark corridors that exist and find and find new things and make new discoveries. So since I'm running out of time, I will uh, just conclude that uh, uh, the ideas that are a part of uh, the Indian knowledge system are in fact extraordinarily different from what uh, modern education uh, teaches all of us because we are all, we all buy into the idea of incrementalism because that is the normal uh, sense that we have of ourselves as bodies. So this body wants to obtain more and more while this other idea which we might want to call the yogic idea and perhaps that uh, is a harder state to get in and that's what connects us to all the extraordinary stories um, that we hear. But finally, to, uh, to conclude the whole thing, if we were to now look ahead uh, where the world is going, uh, since automation and uh, AI is going to make most jobs go away, and uh, clearly the world will not be able to support 10 billion people, maybe there will be jobs for mm, 400 million people. So the population will have to go down drastically. So in the medium term, um, in the short term, maybe the kind of challenges that uh, we see uh, rising up already in Europe and the United States uh, and perhaps in other countries are the beginning of a very turbulent period. A turbulent period which at this point may be seen to arise as a reaction to maybe violence and terror and this and that, but in the longer term the driver of this turbulence would be automation because people will lose jobs, you can't stop it and ultimately the way out to, to go beyond all these challenges would for mankind, for humanity to explore the inner spaces which is the whole world of consciousness. Just as 17th century or 18th century when uh, Europe was poor, they went out as explorers, discovered the new world, that capital gave them all the resources and we had, a, we had the scientific and the industrial revolutions. I am quite sure that we are on the threshold of a new revolution which will be the spiritual revolution. And this revolution cannot be stopped because the way things are going, if you tell everybody in schools and colleges and through the media that you are nothing but the body and all that there is to life is sensations and you already run through all of them through uh, while, you are, while you are not even out of the middle school or high school, clearly that cannot lead to uh, any good results for humanity. So I am quite convinced that we are on the threshold of perhaps what could be a golden era and that golden era would uh, begin by acknowledging first of all that there is another dimension which is already a part of um, science at its deepest level as in quantum mechanics and once we acknowledge it perhaps the way we do education, perhaps the way we do a lot of the things in our uh, transactions would change and that would change everything. Thank you.